There are three types of dehydration, mild, moderate, and severe. To treat mild dehydration, you can use a oral rehydration solution. Who recommends that this ORS solution should have a low osmolarity? An example of this is half-strength apple juice. This has shown to be effective and it actually approximates an oral rehydration solution. Patients are more likely to drink diluted or half-strength apple juice because of its taste compared to electrolyte solutions. Low osmolarity solutions contain glucose and water, which decreases stool frequency, emesis, and the need for IV fluids compared to higher osmolarity solutions like soda and most sports drinks. If you notice that a patient has severe dehydration, that's when you supplement with IV fluids. But as it pertains to children with mild dehydration, that's when you can use oral rehydration with low osmolarity drinks such as half-strength apple juice. Water can increase the risk of hyponatremia in children. So if a patient presents with mild dehydration, you're not going to just recommend, hey, drink tons of water. You'd recommend something like half-strength apple juice. In newborns, they should all receive bilateral hearing screening completed before hospital discharge. If an infant fails initial hearing screening in one or both ears, one of the most common causes is that the vernix is in the air canal and that can cause them to have a failed hearing test, but you can repeat that like a day later and it will be normal. But if you do that and they're still having like abnormal hearing tests, then you can repeat a bilateral audiology evaluation at three months of age to ensure early identification of hearing loss and therefore maximizing speech perception and development. Breastfed infants. So breastfed infants should be supplemented with iron and vitamin D. The dose of iron supplementation depends on the gestational age. So if a breastfed infant was born before 37 weeks gestation, you should supplement iron at 2 mg per kilogram per day after one month of life. But if they were born after 37 weeks gestation, then you can supplement iron at 1 mg per kilogram per day after 4 months of life. It is also recommended that all infants, breastfed infants that is, should be given 400 units of vitamin D. If a patient is being breastfed and they're also consuming water, additional water consumption can actually decrease milk intake and cause electrolyte disturbances. Fluoride supplementation and the introduction of cereal are not recommended until about 6 months of age. So this point is for all infants, not only breastfed infants, but you need to assess growth and development for an indication of like needing caloric fortification. Patients normally receive caloric fortification with formula. So doing caloric fortification is more appropriate for small for gestational age infants or those born below the 10th percentile. So let's say that you have a patient that was exposed to measles. It's very important to know measles post-exposure prophylaxis. Vaccine must be administered within 72 hours of exposure. Or you can give the immunoglobulin within 6 days of exposure. It's very important that you do not administer the MMR vaccine and immunoglobulin simultaneously as this practice invalidates the vaccine. In infants that are less than 12 months of age, they are considered to be at high risk for complications from measles and should receive post-exposure MMR vaccine, although intramuscular immunoglobulin is also an option.
Children and healthcare workers who are otherwise fully vaccinated do not need additional prophylaxis. Pregnant women cannot receive the MMR vaccine due to fetal risk, but they should receive IV immunoglobulin if they do not have evidence of immunity. Acne is also a common condition that you need to know the treatment for. So first-line therapy for acne typically includes topical retinoids such as adapalene that patients can even receive over the counter and benzoyl peroxide. It's very important that patients know that this trial should be between 8 to 12 weeks. Sometimes you'll have patients that try it out for a week or three weeks and stop because they didn't see results. It's very important that you explain to them that, you know, changes may not be seen until around 8 to 12 weeks, so they need to be adherent to the regimen that you prescribed. Topical antibiotics may be added to topical retinoids or benzoyl peroxide. This allows you to achieve better symptom control. So when you combine a topical retinoid with a topical antibiotic, or you combine benzoyl peroxide with a topical antibiotic, this is more effective than using this on their own. It's very important that you avoid using topical antibiotics on their own because this can cause antibiotic resistance if you use it on their own. If you also add antibiotics, it's very important that you do not use them for more than 12 weeks. Clindamycin is also preferred over erythromycin. Benzoyl peroxide is effective in the treatment of acne because it reduces the concentration of cystic acne with no risk of bacterial resistance. Oftentimes, you hear patients say that they're using salicylic acid and they're not seeing any improvements or changes. Uh, there's lots of evidence that, that this acid is effective in combating acne despite its widespread use. Tazarotene is effective in the treatment of acne, but it is teratogenic. Even its name kind of sounds teratogenic, to be honest. But it's a category X drug and should be avoided in women of reproductive age. Combined oral contraceptives can also be effective. But it's very important to know that if a patient has acne and the question is asking about first line treatment, then you need to choose a topical retinoid or benzoyl peroxide. If the patient or the question stem mentions that they're using that, but it's not, you know, really give them any results, then you can add a topical antibiotic such as clindamycin. If a patient presents with functional constipation, the recommended treatment is to use Mirilax or polyethylene glycol solution. This has been found to be more effective than lactulose, seno, or magnesium hydroxide. There is no evidence to support the use of fiber supplements in the treatment of functional constipation. So your go-to uh, treatment for functional constipation is polyethylene glycol. And you can use low-dose regimens of this, which includes 0.3 grams per kilogram per day, or high doses up to 1 to 1.5 grams per kilogram per day. So dental caries is one of the most prevalent chronic conditions among children in the United States. However, early and consistent dental care in infants has been shown to reduce the rate of early childhood caries. AAP Dentistry recommends the use of low floor toothpaste for tooth cleaning and starting with newly erupted teeth. Brushing an infant twice daily with a smear of fluoridated toothpaste is recommended. Fluoride in toothpaste is more effective for the prevention of caries when wiping or brushing the teeth with water. 
bronchiolitis. This is a common lower respiratory tract infection in young children and infants. RSV is the most common cause. Treatment of bronchiolitis includes supportive care with hydration and maintenance of oxygen saturation. Infants with respiratory rates greater than 60 per minute are often unable to manage oral hydration due to the risk of aspiration. In these cases, IV or nasogastric feeds are acceptable. An oxygen saturation greater than 90% is sufficient in RSV bronchiolitis and use of supplemental oxygen to achieve higher levels of oxygen saturation may prolong hospital stays. Routine nasal suctioning is indicated, however there is no clear advantage to deep nasal suctioning which may also be associated with prolonged hospital stays. So if you've ever done any USMLE-SEP exam, you've seen a question on fetal alcohol syndrome. The classic facial dysmorphologies associated with fetal alcohol syndrome are a smooth philtrum, shortened palpable fissures, and a thin vermilion border of the upper lip. Two out of these three characteristics are required for diagnosis of fetal alcohol syndrome. So remember, you have three, smooth philtrum, shortened palpable fissures, and a thin vermilion border of the upper lip. You need two out of three of these to diagnose fetal alcohol syndrome. You can also see other dysmorphologies such as clinodactyly, which is a curvature of a digit, it's also associated with camptodactyly, which is a flexion deformity of the fingers. Other flexion contractors, radar ulnar synostosis, scoliosis, and spinal malformations may also be seen. So long ago, there was this myth that, hey, if we have an egg allergy, you cannot receive the influenza vaccine. But... The CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends that patients with egg allergies receive the influenza vaccine. Previously, unvaccinated patients ages 6 months to 8 years old should receive two doses of either trivalent or quadrivalent vaccines separated by one month. If you see that you have an infant, and they have seizures or had a seizure. What are some risk factors that this infant may have recurrent seizures? Well, these risk factors include two unprovoked seizures more than 24 hours apart, epileptiform abnormalities on an EEG, abnormal brain imaging results, severe head trauma, a syndrome associated with epilepsy. In children who do not have any of these risk factors, anti-epileptic drug therapy is not indicated after a first unprovoked seizure. If therapy is indicated, monotherapy should be the initial approach. Abdominal pain. Ultrasound is recommended as the first-line imaging modality to evaluate acute abdominal pain in children. It avoids radiation exposure and is useful for detecting many causes of abdominal pain, including appendicitis. Developmental dysplasia of the hip. The AAP recommends routine screening of all newborns with physical examination maneuvers. Do you remember the name of these physical examination maneuvers? Leave their names in the comment section below and a description of how each is done. Because I realize that oftentimes medical students remember the names of the maneuvers, but not how to distinguish which is which and how to do it properly. Some risk factors of developmental dysplasia of the hip include 
breach in the third trimester, family history of DDH, personal history of instability. Additional risk factors include female sex, firstborn status, illegal hydramnios, and a large for gestational age infant. The AAP recommends that a child's hemoglobin level should be measured at 12 months of age. Let's talk a little bit more about dental caries. The USPSTF recommends oral fluoride supplementation for the prevention of dental caries beginning at age 6 months for children whose primary water supply is fluoride deficient. Twice yearly application of fluoride varnish to primary teeth should begin when the first tooth comes in and repeated every six months thereafter in children. This is why we recommend that children go to the dentist every six months. So we're not talking about the fact that, hey, they should only brush their teeth twice yearly. This applies specifically to the application of fluoride varnish, which is done at their dental appointments. So let's say that you have a patient that has a sickle cell and they are four years old. A screening test that you need to consider doing or to check if it has already been done is to screen with a transcranial Doppler ultrasound. This is because patients with sickle cell disease are at an increased risk for vascular disease, especially stroke. So all sickle cell patients between the ages of 2 to 16 years of age should be screened with transcranial Doppler ultrasound. The recommended course of action in patients with hepatitis media with effusion is to follow up in 3 months. Medications such as antihistamines, decongestants, antibiotics, corticosteroids, they are not recommended. Autism. The only evidence-based treatment that confers significant benefits to children with autism is intensive behavioral interventions, which should be initiated before three years of age. AAP recommends that autism is screened at the 18-month or 24-month visit by giving the MCHAT questionnaire or form. Internal tibial torsion. So let's say that you have a 3-year-old male and his toes turn inwards, causing a clumsy gait when he walks. You diagnose internal tibial torsion because his feet point inward when his patellae face forward. Internal tibial torsion usually resolves spontaneously by age 5. Surgery may be considered in children older than 8 years of age who have a severe residual deformity, especially if it is symptomatic or cosmetically unacceptable. Marfan syndrome. These patients may have an arm span greater than height, a high arch palate, kyphosis, lenticular dislocation, mitral valve prolops, myopia, and pectus excavatum. Cardiac exam may reveal an aortic insufficiency murmur or murmur associated with mitral valve prolapse. Let's say that you have a 10-year-old that presents with gynecomastia. The questions that may ask, what is the next best step in treatment? Typically, this condition will resolve between 6 to 24 months after onset. So we provide reassurance and patient education about this condition. So the most appropriate step is to follow up with this patient in 6 to 12 months. So it's either, you know, reassurance, patient education, or follow up in 6 to 12 months. It's never to just go ahead and give 
medication to this patient. This condition is often bilateral, but it's more common on the left side if it is unilateral. If a patient does present with gynecomastia, it's important to ask them if they're taking any medications or supplements because these may be a cause of non-physiologic breast enlargement. Concerning factors for gynecomastia include persistence for longer than two years, hard immobile non-tender masses, masses greater than 5 cm, nipple discharge, testicular masses, and systemic symptoms such as weight loss. Evaluation of persistent gynecomastia can include lab studies such as hepatic, renal, and thyroid function tests. Lead poisoning. The most reliable and cost-effective way to protect U.S. children from lead toxicity is primary prevention which includes reducing or eliminating the sources of lead in the community. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever The treatment for this condition must be started as soon as the diagnosis is suspected in order to decrease mortality. Doxycycline is the only approved therapy for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever for individuals of all ages including children less than 8 years of age. I mention this because in a condition such as Lyme disease, uh, doxycycline can be used in adults or children older than 8 years of age, but in Lyme disease, if they're less than 8 years of age, you want to use another drug such as azithromycin. So you might be wondering why. That's because doxycycline is a tetracycline, and in patients that are less than 8 years of age, it can cause, you know, defects to the teeth. So, it's typically avoided to prevent any adverse reactions in children less than 8 years of age. But for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, you just go ahead and you give doxycycline. That is the only approved therapy. Just like in, let's say, Kawasaki's disease. Typically, we avoid using aspirin because of the risk of Bry syndrome. However, in Kawasaki's disease, we still go ahead and give aspirin. That's because the benefits outweigh the risks. Head lice. Head lice is a relatively common infestation in school-aged children and adolescents. And children with this condition are usually stigmatized. Since transmission rates are relatively low in the classroom setting and treatments can be expensive and difficult, children are suspected of having head lice should remain in class and should not be treated unless there is a clear diagnosis. Nits and louse eggs do not necessarily present an active infectious case of head lice. Children's privacy should be respected appropriately. And in most cases, there is no need to notify an entire class or school of the presence of a case of lice. So just like you have, like, let's say, tinea capitis or tinea corporis or tinea pedis, you have names for lice that correlates to the different body parts that are affected. So you have pediculosis capitis, pediculosis corporis, pediculosis pubis, pediculosis ciliaris. So this correlates to different parts of the body that's affected. You can take a moment and really commit this to memory just in case an examiner tries to trip you up on which is which. But when we talk about head lice, we're typically referring to pediculus human capitis and it's transmitted from direct head-to-head -head contact, sharing hair accessories, bedding, or clothing. These patients can present with scalp or neck pruritus. Detection of nymphs and adult lice on the scalp or hair is required to diagnose a patient with head lice. First line treatment includes 1% permethrin shampoo or pyrethin. So you want to 
Apply pyrethin to the scalp and leave it on for about 10 minutes. Then you follow up with a mechanical remover of lice and nits with a fine tooth comb. You want to go ahead and repeat this application after 10 days. For children with a fever without localizing signs, management depends on the child's age and findings on exam. If a patient is 3 to 36 months of age with a fever that is around 102 degrees Fahrenheit, it is appropriate to provide reassurance that this is likely a self-limited viral infection. If that's like the only symptom present and there are no other like concerning signs or symptoms. However, if the patient has a fever greater than 100 degrees Fahrenheit and they're six months of age or uncircumcised boys, less than two-year-olds, and the child received the appropriate vaccines on schedule, then you may want to go ahead and do a urinalysis and culture. However, a more extensive workup would be appropriate if the child is less than three months of age. So this slide is basically highlighting the fact that if you have a patient with fever without localizing signs, you need to look at their age and how high the fever is. So 3 to 36 months and the fever is less than 102, reassurance may be appropriate. But if the patient is less than three months, then he needs to do a more extensive workup. If the patient is has a temperature that is greater than 102 and they're less than six months of age or uncircumcised, then UA and culture. So this occurs when there's an injury to the distal extensor tendon of the finger at the distal interphalangeal joint. It's usually caused by forceful flexion of an extended DIP joint, for example, being struck by an object such as a ball. The inability to actively extend the DIP joint is a hallmark of mallet finger. The inability to passively extend the DIP joint completely may be an indication of trapped soft tissue or bone that may require surgery. So assessing the ability to extend the DIP joint actively or passively is a determinant of what type of treatment options you should offer. So treatment includes splinting with strict use of the splint and avoidance of any flexion of the DIP joint. Athletic activities may be continued with the splint in place. Baby-Friendly Hospital Initiative This global program was established by UNICEF and WHO to promote healthy infant feeding and mother-baby bonding. The primary objective is to educate the public on the benefits of breastfeeding and encourage, promote, and facilitate breastfeeding as outlined in the UNICEF WHO 10 Steps to Successful Breastfeeding chart. These steps promote breastfeeding to the public and provide guidelines for hospitals and birthing centers for the successful initiation and continuation of breastfeeding. All pregnant women should be informed about the benefits and management of breastfeeding. Mothers should be helped to initiate breastfeeding within an hour after birth and shown how to breastfeed and to maintain lactation even if they are separated from their infants. Breastfeeding infants should not be given food other than breast milk unless medically indicated. If mothers choose to give formula after appropriate education, they should be instructed in proper preparation and use. Wombing in should be practiced, allowing mothers and infants to remain together 24 hours a day. Mothers should be encouraged to breastfeed on demand. Breastfeeding infants should not be given pacifiers or artificial nipples. Mothers should be referred to breastfeeding support groups on discharge from the hospital. The hospital must comply with the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, 
which requires that formula companies cannot give free gifts to staff or mothers. Molluscum contagiosum. This is caused by a pox virus. This is described as a flesh-colored dome-shaped papule, most commonly on the trunk, axilla, popliteal, or antecubital fossae, and crural folds. If lesions are asymptomatic and not inflamed, the initial treatment is observation, with most lesions resolving spontaneously within 2 to 12 months. If the lesions are inflamed or pyritic, then topical corticosteroids treatment, chemical treatment with cantharidine, curatage, or cryotherapy may be indicated. Muscular dystrophy. Head lag due to neck muscle weakness in infants is a classic early finding of muscular dystrophies. Toe walking is a sign of quadriceps weakness. Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy are excellent recessive diseases. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is due to a frame shift deletion and is more severe. The age of onset is between 2 to 3 years old. Becker muscular dystrophy is due to an in-frame deletion and it is less severe and it's not typically evident before 15 years of age. So, the fact that Becker is less severe you can remember by saying Becker is better. Duchenne muscular dystrophy typically leads to an inability to ambulate by age 12. Patients with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy may have weak reflexes, muscle paresis and atrophy, Gower's maneuver, calf pseudohypertrophy, scoliosis, and dilated cardiomyopathy is a common cause of death. Glucocorticoids for example, prednisone or deflasacort may be used in DMD and BMD. Etepresin, probably saying that wrong, but that drug can only be used in patients with mutations within exon 51 of the dystrophin gene. It is an antisense oligonucleotide that binds to exon 51 of the dystrophin RNA prior to splicing, which leads to skipping of this exon. This results in production of truncated but functional dystrophin gene. If a patient has signs of increased muscular tone, such as cross-legged posturing, neck stiffness, and hyperreflexia, this can suggest a central cause of motor delay such as cerebral palsy. A newborn's eyes are sometimes crossed. Assuming the intermittent eye crossing persists, which one of the following is most appropriate for ophthalmologic referral at age 6 months? In many normally developing infants, there may be imperfect coordination of eye movements and alignment during the early days and weeks of life, but proper coordination should be achieved by four to six months. Persistent deviation of an eye in an infant requires evaluation. Speaking of eye conditions, let's briefly discuss amblyopia. This is one of the most common causes of vision abnormalities in children and early detection and treatment can prevent vision loss. USPSTF recommends vision screening for all children at least once between 3 to 5 years of age to detect the presence of amblyopia or its risk factors. There has been some research done on the most effective way to administer liquid medications. A randomized controlled trial demonstrated that over 40% of patients, or rather parents, made dosing errors with medicine cups compared to a 17% error rate with an oral syringe. 
So they had better results in accurate dosing with oral syringes. It's important to note that oral syringes are marked with milliliters, not cubic centimeters. So dosages or your prescription instructions should use milliliters.